Well, we are studying in 1 Thessalonians, but we're going to begin today over in Matthew chapter 4. So please turn to Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> the Gospel of Matthew, that's your first book in the New Testament. And if you didn't bring a Bible today, we will be projecting the verses up on the screen so you can watch that or see the scriptures there. You know, it's, it's uh, and of course people can do what they want. We believe in the autonomy of the local church, but there are still churches who uh, think that if you project verses, you're going liberal. Um, uh, it's just kind of, uh, I just don't understand that. Uh, folks, we need all the exposure to the Scripture we can get, whether it's in your paper Bible, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on your tablet, whether it's on a piece of paper, whether it's on a screen, regardless of where it is, whether you're listening to it, which is, by the way, a great way. By the way, for the majority of time, the way that the, that the Word of God was shared with people was audibly. That is the, the longest period has been through the audible. Um, and so keep that in mind, okay, before we start judging people and saying, well, you shouldn't be uh, reading the Bible that way or this or seeing the Bible. And I, no, 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 no. Listen, believe me. Believe me. Uh, there are people who would give anything if they could have what we have when it comes to the Scriptures. And so today we're talking about the supernatural ministry of the Word of God. In Matthew 4.4, 4, when Jesus was being tempted, uh, what did Jesus do? Uh, Jesus didn't say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm the Son of God, I'm strong, go away. No, what he did was he quoted Scripture. Now, I think that's fascinating that God himself, the author of Scripture, the living Word, would quote, quote the written Word. Okay, and he says in Matthew 4, 4, he answered the devil and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. A man in Kansas City was severely injured in an explosion. Evangelist Robert L. Sumner tells about him in his book, The Wonders of the Word of God. The victim's face was badly disfigured, and he lost his eyesight as well as both hands. He was just a new Christian, and one of his greatest disappointments was that he could no longer read the Bible. Then he heard about a lady in England who read Braille with her lips. Hoping to do the same, he sent for some books of the, of the Bible in Braille. Much to his dismay, however, he discovered that the nerve endings in his lips had been destroyed by the explosion. One day, as he brought one of the Braille pages to his lips, his tongue happened to touch a few of the raised let, uh, characters, and he could feel them. Like a flash, he thought, I can read the Bible using my tongue. At the time Robert Sumner wrote his book, the man had read through the entire Bible four times. How much of a commitment do we have to the Word of God? Here's a man who did, went to unbelievable uh, labor to get the Scriptures and to bring them in, and then uh, we see going and opening the Bible and reading it sometimes, we see it as a chore, or, or Christians complain about, well, do I have to read the Bible? Uh, friends, I'll tell you, when we have that mentality, it shows how far away from God's way we really are. I want you to go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 as we pick up our study here in 1 Thessalonians. I have a statement to make, and I want you to think about it, because on the surface, it may not seem true with all the Bible apps, with all the talk about reading plans today, and all of that that is out there. The truth of it is, folks, the statistics tell us something far different than what we're saying. You see, there's, at this point, there's, there's plenty of exposure today to the Word of God, contrary to popular belief. We have more access to it than we've ever had before. 
The problem, though, is this. It isn't access to the Word of God in America. The problem is, do we believe it's the Word of God in America? There's a big difference between the two. Now, there are people who say, oh, yes, I believe the Bible's the Word of God. But yet, at the same time, when we come upon the hard parts of Scripture, the the parts of Scripture that challenge us, convict us to change, for one reason or another. Then all of a sudden, we go somewhere else besides the Bible to end up making the final decisions about those issues of life. The truth of it is this. If when we are faced with the Word of God and the challenges and the, and the conviction sometimes that the Holy Spirit brings, and we decide to look for another opinion, and by the way, oftentimes it ends up being our own, we've strayed As a matter of fact, there's a very strong word for that in the Bible. It's called apostasy. To leave the truth. To stray away from the truth. Okay? A major problem today in the church is that many no longer truly believe the Bible is the Word of God. And by the way, that explains why, what is it, 75 to 80 percent of young people today, once they graduate from high school and go to college, they never go back to church. Wait a minute. You were raised in a Bible-believing church. You were raised in a Christian home. You went to a Christian school. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. You don't believe the Bible's the Word of God. The truth of it is, there was a point before you ever left that you decided that you weren't sure that it was. And you know what, folks? It can happen to us. And I'm talking about those of us who are in church today. In other words, they don't respect the Bible as such. They do not believe that it is the final authority for faith and practice, even though we can say that over and over. Oh, yes, I believe the Bible is my final authority for faith and practice. Is it? Is it? Is that where we go when we're faced with the difficult decisions of life? What about creation? People say, well, I don't, I'm I'm walking, there are a lot of people, I'm walking away from the Bible and no longer believe it because I can't believe in creation. I believe in evolution. I don't believe in creation any longer. Uh, Wait a minute, you've just forsaken, friend, let me tell you something. If you believe in evolution, you don't believe in creation, You have not done your homework. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, The evidence is so clearly, and it's right in front of us, it's, it's right in our face why creation is, in fact, the way the world came into existence. And by the way, if creation is true, then evolution is not true. There is no such thing as theistic evolution. That's not what it says. Well, you do you really believe that the Bible was created in six days? Yes. Well, you don't really believe 24-hour periods, do you? Yes. Read Exodus 20. It solves it. It answers it. God put it down, and you can put your pen down. You can bank on it. Six literal days. Well, I can't believe that. Wait a minute. Why not? You must have a really little puny God. You know what? My God could have made it in six seconds. He could have done it all in one second if he wanted, because that's the God of the Bible. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. Folks, when we come face-to-face with Scripture and when we say, well, you know what, I don't buy that, you are, in fact, taking the place of God in your life. Jesus didn't do it. He was God in the flesh. Why do we do it? Creation. How about biblical marriage? Here's another one. Biblical marriage. What is biblical marriage? One man, one woman for life. One man, one woman for life. Not two men, not two women, okay? One man, one woman for life. That's God's plan for marriage, okay? What about, here's one controversial one today. And by the way, what I just mentioned is extremely controversial today. And by the way, a lot of people who claim to be evangelical Christians are getting very soft on the idea of what constitutes marriage. God has never changed. One man, one woman, 
for life. Read the first two chapters of Genesis and then also the Gospels. Jesus reiterates it in the Gospels. Here's a a controversial one, male leadership in the local church. Now listen, I think the world of women, I mean, I married one. (laughs) But listen, women are tremendous asset to the local church, but not in the pulpit. Say, well, you know, that's an old idea. And then we say, no, do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe the Word of God? Say, well, I'm not coming back to this church. I don't like that idea. So what you're telling me is this. You reject what God says because it doesn't sit well with you. Do you see the problem in that, dear friend? You are making yourself God. Now, Now that people don't like me, let's continue. What made, getting on the positive side of this, what made the Thessalonians such a vibrant, excited group of young believers who were on fire for Christ? We're going to look at one major thing today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing... And in the context, it's about you guys. That's what he was getting at. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in, in, in you that believe. As we continue in our series, I continue to be impressed by these young believers in Thessalonica and their excitement about Jesus Christ. They had the zeal that every believer should have. If you've trusted Christ as Savior, do you have zeal for Christ in your life? Are you excited about serving the Lord? If not, why not? One of the things God produces, uh, uh, see, if we willingly submit to the Word of God and we do the Word of God, one of the things God produces in our life is zeal. Zeal. The word zeal, okay? We, zealous. The, uh, the, uh, the New Testament word, it means boiling hot. Are you hot for Christ? Okay? People talk about people today. They'll say, well, that guy's hot. That, that girl's hot. Okay? You certainly don't mean it like God means it. You're talking carnality. You're talking lust. No, boiling hot excited, on fire, enthusiastic for Jesus Christ. Does that describe me as a Christian? Does that describe you? If not, why not? That's what God wants. Titus, by the way, we won't go there. Titus chapter 2 is very clear that that is what God produces in the life of one who responds properly, a believer who responds properly to the grace of God and walks with Christ. They will become zealous of good works. Now, what made them this way? Well, a major factor was that they had a proper view of Scripture, and that's what we see in verse 13. You see, it effectively works in us who believe it. Do you see at the end of verse 13, the Word of God which effectually or effectively worketh also in you that believe? This is, this is amazing. And what does this speak about? It speaks about the supernatural ministry of the Word of God, the supernatural ministry of the Word of God. Folks, this book that I hold in my hand, this is a supernatural book. It is God-breathed. It is not like any other book. You can buy a book or download a book or however you want to do it, some other book, maybe it's a novel, maybe it's a cookbook, whether it's this or whether it's that, okay, a biography, whatever it may be. And guess what? Once you've read that book, you've read that book. And many times you never read it again. Not always, I know, but many times you never read it again. This is a book that is always new, that is always fresh. And as you get into the Word of God, it speaks to you today where you're at in your circumstances, and the Holy Spirit of God, who authored it, is going to 
impress that on our minds. It's a living book. It's, it's God breathe. So we're looking at the supernatural ministry of the Word of God. Several things I want to touch on today. Number one is this, the value of the Word, the value of the Word. What makes it so valuable? Well, it is in fact the Word of God. It is inspired. Now, the word inspired means God breathed. God breathed it out, all right? Man is not the author of the Bible. God is the author of the Bible. God used man to get it onto paper, all right? He, he put the thoughts in their minds. He guided their thought process. And yes, he did use their personality. We see that. But nevertheless, it was God who was giving it, okay? Listen, even though God used man, what we have here, if God himself had done the writing, it would be no more authoritative or accurate than it is. That's, that's the proper view of Scripture. Anything less than that, that person is settling for less than what it is. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at this with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, just a few pages over to your right. <clears throat> It says in verse 16, all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed. And look what it says. It is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, that's conviction, for correction, that's restoration, for instruction, that's training, in righteousness, okay? It's profitable for all of these things, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, the idea is complete, thoroughly furnished, or thoroughly furnished unto all good works, all right? Now, what does all that mean? Well, let me, let me give you some practical applications or explanations of that, all right? First is this. It is our source of salvation. The Word of God is the source of our salvation. In other words, this begins with the gospel. Now, around this place, we talk about the gospel a lot. And I say, what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is that Jesus, God in the flesh, came to earth. He died on the cross, paid for our sins, was buried, and rose from the grave three days later. And when you believe, trust in Jesus Christ that he made that payment for you, he gives you everlasting life as a free gift. That is the gospel. Romans 1 uh, verse 16, Paul said this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is, the, it is the power of God unto salvation. And look what it says. To everyone that does what? Believes. Not believes and is baptized, believes and surrenders their life and promises they're going to behave themselves. Well, it's good to behave yourself, okay, but uh, it, it's not a condition to being saved. It's believing, believing. See, salvation is a gift. It's not based on what we do. It's based on what Christ did for us. When we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, He gives us everlasting life. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by man's opinion? No. Talking heads on TV? No. How about talking heads on Fox News? No, no, they're talking heads. That's all they are. There's only one God. There's only one opinion that matters. Do you get tired of opinions? I get tired of hearing people's opinions. Okay? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. This plan of salvation is found in the Bible. And it's in the Bible when we find it and we read it and we understand it and we believe it. God gives us that moment, everlasting life. We are born into the family of God. If you're visiting with us today, I want you to understand this. Let me explain it, this gospel, very clearly to you. Pay close attention, please, okay? I'm going to let this hand represent you and me. We're going to take this wallet. It says on here, sin. Somebody asked me. Oh, was it last week or the week before? Does that wallet, and I get it because you're a ways off. Does that wallet, does it actually say, does it say sin on it? I said, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Some man was so impressed with the hand gesture. I believe it's, he was in New Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. He was the father of someone who used to come to our church. 
and this, this uh, young, young dad explained the gospel with the wallet. And the guy liked it so much, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him a wallet with sin on it, and I'm going to send it to him. And so they sent it to me in the mail. So I've been using it ever since. Here it is, sin. But that doesn't sound good. I've been using sin ever since, okay? Um, not good. Here we go, though. Look here. This hand representing you and me, this wallet representing our sin, we are all sinners. We all have sin on us. Yet, God loves us, hates our sin, loves us. You see, sin separates us from being with the Lord. Do we understand, folks, you could not, you'll never get into heaven with even one sin. The Bible says heaven's a perfect place. Not even one lie, not even one wrong deed can get into heaven. It's perfect. If heaven was like earth, we'd it'd have all the problems that earth has. It would not be a promotion, would it? It would not be something to look forward to. Here we are, we're sinners. God says because we've sinned, there's a penalty that goes with that. We'll have to pay a price. The wages of sin is death. You would have to die physically and then be separated from God forever. By the way, the word death means separation. That's what it means. If I die with my sin, I'll be separated from God forever, and so will you. So will you. Now, most people, here's where they kick in. They used to, anyway. They'll say, oh, okay, okay, I see the problem. I'll behave myself. I'll start going to church every week. Well, I hope you do. We'd love to have you here. I'll give money. Good. I'll go water baptized. Well, not until you trust Christ in this church. I'll behave myself. I'll promise God I'm going to clean up my act and all these things, thinking that that will take away the sin. No, the wages of sin is death. Death is the only thing that will take away sin. If you do it, you're going to have to die and then spend forever separated from God because there are no second chances once you die. Say, what about purgatory? It's made up. It's not in the Bible. It's made up. So then what are you going to do if you die with your sin? You're lost forever. We're all sinners. What we need is we need a way to get rid of the sin before we die. Okay? Guess what? A solution has been given. And it's not based on what we do. It's based on what God did for us through his son. Because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves, God sent his son only begotten Son into the world, here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the satisfactory payment for our sin. Jesus came when He died on the cross. He took our sin upon Himself, made the payment. Three days later, came back from the dead. He says, I've paid for all your sins. If you will believe in me, trust in me that I made that payment for you, I'll give you everlasting life. Now look, dear friend, because people see that and say, well, everybody's going to heaven. No. No. It's not good on your behalf until you put your faith in Jesus Christ. When you do, your sins are taken away. He paid the debt 2,000 years ago, but it's not good on your behalf until you trust him as your Savior. And when you trust him as your Savior, that's what the word believe means. When you believe in him, when you trust in him that he made that payment for you the moment you do, Your sins are forgiven. He gives you everlasting life. Everlasting life? Yeah, you know what that means? It means you go to heaven. When? The moment you've trusted Christ, you have it. Therefore, it doesn't matter when you die, you still have it because it's everlasting. You're going to go live with God forever. Now, that is good news. And that's what the word gospel means. And today, you can be sure of going to heaven before you ever walk out of here if you'll trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. He'll give you that gift of eternal life. So number one, it's the source of salvation. But secondly, it's the source that the Lord uses most to change our lives once we are saved. Once we're saved. You know, when when people trust Christ the Savior, their sins are taken care of. They go to heaven. You can't be lost once you're saved because there's no sin to send you to hell. Jesus took care of it all. So there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. But that doesn't mean once we're saved that we're automatically perfect and godly in character, okay? Matter of fact, in this life, we'll never be perfect. 
But we can grow and we can become more godly. What is the agent that does that? It's the Word of God that does that. It is the source that the Lord uses most to change our lives once we are saved. Jesus said, praying to the Father, He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Sanctify, set them apart, make them pure and holy. How? Through the Word of God. Okay? A lot of you know Psalm 1. You can turn there with me if you'd like to look at it, okay? Or just keep keep following along. But it says this in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight means you love it, right? Delight. There are people last night who were delighted at the chili cook-off. And you know what? It wasn't the chili they were delighted with. It was the brownies. <laughs> Their delight is in the brownies of the bakers at church. And in those brownies, they indulge day and night. No, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, that's the word of God, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. What is going to happen to the person who is meditating, okay, thinking, chewing on the word of God day and night? I can give you, right in verse 3, there are five benefits, okay? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. First, stability. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You're getting proper nutrition, okay? Your root system is growing. That's stability. That means when the trials and the difficulties of life come into your life, You don't get blown away by them, okay? Secondly, spiritual health, spiritual health, okay? You know if you water your plants, there's a better chance they're going to survive than if you don't water your plants. Spiritual health. Third, fruitfulness. Bringeth forth his fruit in a season. Christians ought to be bearing fruit, By meditating, gladly meditating on the Word of God, it will change the way we think, which will change the way we live, which will end up in fruit-bearing for Christ. Fourth, his leaf also shall not wither. Endurance under trial. Endurance under trial. You keep going. You won't throw in the towel. You won't get so discouraged as a Christian where you walk away. These kids who are walking away from Christianity... They're not joyfully meditating in the Word of God day and night. Because if they were, they wouldn't be walking away. And number five, there will be success. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Doesn't mean you'll be rich and famous. When God thinks of success, he means spiritually. You'll be spiritually successful. So it is the source that the Lord uses most to change our lives once we are saved. Third, it is the source of our understanding. Listen, I'm not telling anybody anything new, but folks, this can be a confusing place to live in this world. This world is confusing at times. What brings clarity to our thought process, the Word of God? Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. You want to understand the world? You say, I don't know why people don't just love each other. I can't we just, you know, I want a bumper sticker that says coexist. Why can't people just coexist? Okay. Imagine. My favorite song is John Lennon's Imagine song. Yeah, you are imagining. You don't understand what the problem is. We can't coexist because we're sinners who reject the truth of God. That's why we can't coexist. If we were all, if we've all trusted Christ the Savior and we were walking with the Lord, okay, and we were tuned to the same instrument, which is God and His Word, we could coexist really well. There'd be harmony. Well, I'm not interested in that. You see where man is? He creates his own problems. 
A teacher was handed on Tuesday morning, a teacher was handed the following note by one of her students. Dear teacher, please excuse Harriet for missing school yesterday. We forgot to get the Sunday paper off the porch, and when we found it on Monday, we thought it was Sunday. Confused. A lot of people are confused, aren't they? Fourth, it is our source of growth. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere, the undefiled, the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The taking in and the application of the word of God produces spiritual growth. Can I tell you, folks, there are many churches today who have a lot of gray-headed babies in them. People who got saved who never really grew the way they should. And they're still spiritual babies, even though chronologically or, or age-wise, they're older. Maybe you're middle-aged. Maybe it's the same thing with you. So we see, first, we see the value of the word. But secondly, and this is an interesting word, we see the weaponry of the word. What is that referring to? There's a spiritual battle going on, okay? We are either building or battling in our lives. We have to do both. We need to build and we also need to battle. The Bible is our tool and our weapon. You would not go into battle if you were not properly armed, okay? The Bible is referred to in Scripture as the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We need the Word of God. It is our tool. When Jesus was doing battle with the devil, what did he do? He quoted Scripture to him. That's the weapon. Even God himself, when he was here, used it. The weaponry of the word. And can I tell you the spiritual battle? The Thessalonians were in a spiritual battle. Even though they were new believers, relatively speaking, they were engaged. Why? Because they were sharing the gospel. And if you share the gospel, you end up being on the front lines. And if you're on the front lines, you're the first ones to get shot at. Look back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go back there. It says in verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Okay? The Jews meaning the Jews who rejected Jesus Christ as Savior, who were trying to do away with believers and try to discredit their message. Now, I find it interesting, verse 14, for ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God. The word followers means imitators, okay? Now, how was it that the Thessalonians were imitating? Was it that they didn't care about Scripture? No, we see in verse 13, it was paramount in their lives. They were following the other churches, and that as the other churches were following Christ, following the Word of God, they too were doing that, and therefore they were imitating the other churches in those good qualities. Even as they have of the Jews, verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. And verse 16 is a very interesting truth. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. I find that an interesting phrase, forbidding us to speak. Okay? Question. Ponder this. Are we so faithful that someone has to forbid us to speak? Yikes. Or is the truth of it, most people don't even know we're saved? Boy, that's a miserable testimony, isn't it? See, these people, they were so faithful. We saw that in chapter 1, by the way. They were so faithful that 
the, the false teachers had to forbid them, threaten them. If you speak up for Christ, we're going to persecute you. Is that you and me? Do we go through any of that in our own lives? By the way, it's happening, as was mentioned earlier, it's happening all over the world. Yes, persecution is getting greater in the United States, but it's nothing compared to what's going on. And by the way, China is really, it's the persecution in China is really stepped up, as well as places like India and some of these other third world countries. Folks, days are going to get tougher. They're not going to get easier. Verse 17, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, wherefore we would have come to you, I, or even I, Paul, once again, interesting phrase, but Satan hindered us. How did Satan hinder them? Okay, there could be a lot of ways, one of the ways in the context very clearly, using false religious people. To persecute them. Those were tools in the hands of Satan. You see, let me mention this. If you, you know somebody who is hostile towards the gospel, hostile towards Christianity. Now, I'm not saying they, they are not responsible for their hostility, because they are. But we also need to understand this. As we look at that person who is anti-Christian, anti-Bible, etc., etc., mocks us, makes fun of us, ridicules us, Maybe it's prejudice against us for one thing or another. As we look at that situation, understand this. To a point, folks, they're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. A lot of them don't even know what they're doing, such as, remember the, the, the testimony of the Apostle Paul. He thought he was doing God's work in persecuting Christians and having them stoned to death. He thought he was doing the work of God. He took great pleasure, the Bible says, in the stoning of Stephen until he understood who Jesus was and he trusted Christ as a Savior. And what, what did he do? He flipped sides is what he did. See, this proper mindset, okay, of being faithful with the gospel, living for Christ, this proper mindset brings with it persecution. You see, if we allow the word of God to direct our lives, we will often be living in contradiction to the world system. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul says Satan hindered us. There's a spiritual war going on. That's why Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Rulers of the darkness of this world. Okay? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, you know, I don't know. Maybe some of you have a little note in your margin you, you wrote in their Congress. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, not everybody's bad there. Leads us to our third issue, the eternal fruit of the Word of God. You see, the gospel message that we preach that gives everlasting life, where is it found? It's found in the Bible. And we see in verse 19 reference to this, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy, the eternal fruit of the Word. Okay. What is he referring to? He's referring to the Thessalonians, that they trusted Christ as Savior. And guess what, folks? Every soul we lead to Christ is eternal fruit that will never pass away. There is no fruit that remains greater than the one who's born again. Somebody did that. Somebody led you to Christ. You, you got the gospel some way. Let, let me show you this. Hold your place here. Look with me to John chapter 15. 
John chapter 15. Some people say, well, well, this, this verse, 15, 16, isn't this the fruit of the Spirit? Well, no, not directly. I mean, not, not directly in the same sense as what you find in, in Galatians 5. See, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, those things found in, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I believe John 15 is talking about the fruit of the Christian, not the fruit of the Spirit. Now, yes, it's by the Holy Spirit's power. We know that. We know that. But here in John 15, 16, Jesus said to his disciples, save people, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, has nothing to do with their salvation, has to do with their purpose, with his plan for their life. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Your fruit shall remain. Let me ask you this. Is there any greater guarantee that our fruit will remain if our fruit is other believers? People we've led to Christ. Once they trust Christ, they have everlasting life. They're going to remain forever. See, we need to have utmost confidence to what the Word of God is and what the Word of God can accomplish in people's lives. Think about this. If you're saved, think about this. What are you doing with your life? What's the purpose? What are you accomplishing for Christ? Here you go. The only thing in this world you can take to heaven is other people you've won to Christ. Are we going to bring anybody? Are we going to take anybody? Have you ever led a person to Christ? I'm not shaming any of us. I'm just challenging all of us. Okay? Have you ever led a person to Christ? It's the only thing you can take to heaven. That's why Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. And guess what? There's not a Christian who's ever lived who cannot lead another soul to Christ. If you got saved, you know what the gospel contains because that's how you got saved. All God's asking us to do is share it with others. Share it with others. And we're going to close over in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. You could possibly be here today, friend, and um, you're not sure where you're going. Well, I, I explained it hopefully clearly at the beginning of this message. Please listen carefully now. But maybe you're here and, and you've never put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I would love for you to become a child of God today. And if that's my desire, imagine how much God wants that. God is reaching out to you. He's saying, I want to give you the gift of eternal life. Will you receive it? My son, the Lord Jesus Christ, suffered on the cross and paid for your sins, and he purchased your salvation there. And he's offering you eternal life as a gift if you'd simply receive it. You're not making promises. You're not saying, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start. I'm going to stop. You're simply saying, you know what? I get it. I'm a sinner. And I need a payment for my sin. Jesus made the payment. I'm going to accept his payment as mine. I'm going to trust in him that he did that for me. And when you do, he gives you, friend, the gift of everlasting life. How? Simply by faith, by trusting in Christ. John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, Jesus Christ, you receive him as your Savior. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What does that mean to believe on his name? His name, Jesus, means God who is our Savior. You're trusting in him that he is God who will save you. Would you do that today? Would you do it today? Listen, this is the, this is the greatest thing in all the world. I understood this way back in 1972. I know a lot of you weren't even alive then. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. But you know what? 
Not one day since then has this joy and excitement about that message diminished. It has never diminished because it is the good news of God. It is eternal in nature. And I want you to know it. And I want you to trust Christ. And certainly God even more so. Would you trust Christ today as your Savior? Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, and please, no one, no one looking around, no one looking around. Friend, if you've never trusted Christ, would you do that right now? Well, I want to think about it. To just think about it will change nothing for you. If you die thinking about it, you'll still be forever lost in hell. I urge you today to put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You do not have the luxury of the guarantee of living another day, another hour. See, were you trying to scare me? No, not really. I'm telling you the truth, though. Think about it. Can you guarantee another hour? No. Another day? No. Another week? No. You can't guarantee it. People die suddenly all the time. If you die without Christ, you'll suffer forever. I urge you right now, trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You might say, well, I've got questions. You may have questions, but you know what? There are a lot of people who have questions who die without Christ. And by the way, they get it once they're dead. It's just too late. Would you trust in Jesus Christ today right where you sit in the quietness of your mind? You can't make a mistake. You can talk to the Lord if you want. There's no formal prayer, but Lord, I I know, I understand I'm a sinner. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ today to, to save me, to give me that gift of eternal life. God knows your thoughts. You can't make a mistake, and God will save you today. He'll forgive you of all your sin, past, present, and future. He'll give you eternal life, a home in heaven today. You can have it if you'll simply trust in Christ. Would you do it? Would you do it? If today you're trusting Christ as Savior, could I pray for you? In a moment, I'd like to have you lift up your hand. It just lets me know that it made sense to you today and you trusted Christ. You don't have to raise your hand. It will not save you. But I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. Is there anyone who would say with an uplifted hand, yes, today I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Just lift it up, put it down. Anyone? Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. It's a gift, friend. It's a gift. Your good works won't save you. Only Jesus can. Is there anyone? Slip it up, put it down. Father, I do thank you for this day, and we thank you for what we've learned about these Thessalonian believers. We thank you, Father, that you save anyone who will trust in Christ, and that once we've trusted Christ, you've given us this precious gift of the Word of God, preserved for us, accurate, perfect, to where we can understand it, believe it, apply it, and see the blessings of you in our lives. Lord, it just doesn't get any better than this. We thank you for it, and we pray, Father, that uh, each one does understand the gospel and that they've trusted Christ. And if not, that they'll come back, that they'll trust Christ after the service or ask questions or whatever it needs to be, Lord. We want them to be saved. Now, please guide us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and God bless you.